nothing from yesterday. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Marvellous. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, welcome, welcome to day two of uh, Hello Culture. Those of you who were here yesterday, uh, I hope you've had an evening to think about what you're going to do and what's gonna, what you're going to get, you know, help, hope to get out of today. For those of us who are joining us today, who's joining us? Oh, it's a little bit, uh, oh, no, good, lots of hands up. Who's joining us today? Okay, for those of you who were here yesterday, forgive me if I recap slightly. Um, I'll do it very briefly, but our theme for the next, for today and yesterday was uh, innovation, collaboration, and transformation for the nation. No, anyway, no. Um, we talked yesterday about how collaboration is about working together and, and investment. We also talked a lot about investment yesterday. Today's t about taking that investment, putting your capital into new form, giving it new clothes, and actually making it work for you to transform your organization. And I just wanted to say just 30 seconds about transformation. Because transformation, everyone says, oh yeah, yeah, I'm up for that. Yeah, yeah, so want to transform, yeah. You don't, actually, a lot of the time. Because it's hard work, it takes something, and it's scary because it's not change. I, I know that sounds like a that sounds a bit obvious, but transformation isn't change. Change is you have a small frog, and then you get a bigger frog. That's a that's a frog that's changed. A tadpole that becomes a frog is transformation. And I don't know what the tadpole is thinking before it becomes a frog. It, it might not be, you know, I'll level with you, it might not be thinking anything. But I don't know if it just goes by instinct or whether it thinks, actually, I'm liking this one tail swimmy thing. I don't know about the other bit. But I think that's how we are about transformation sometimes. And I think what helps transformation take place is that we can be supported have the compelling drive of evolution. I just made that up. Whoa. But you know, that's probably what drives the tadpole. The compelling drive of evolution. But it's definitely about something bigger than the tadpole that makes it become the frog. And maybe today we're going to find that thing that's going to compel us to transform. Alison, welcome. Um, so, the other thing I didn't mention yesterday uh, for, is that the Hello Culture team, Lara and uh, Big Cat, were working very extensively with Sampad and some young people who are going to um, monitor, uh, d uh, document this, and actually they're also involved in the creation and selection of the panels, and they'll be uh, participating in some of the workshops and things today to get their vo let their voice be heard in, you know, in the whole uh, creation of this event and to help us think about the future. I think it's great that we look at young people. Little plea for me, maybe next time, we also should involve, I think, lot older people. And I think young people are often the focus of our conversations around digital. But, you know, 60 plus. Speaking as someone, bluntly, without kids, who's nearer 60 than 16, old people next, thank you. That's just me. Anyway, how today is going to go. So you're all very welcome. You've got your packs, I hope. Um, we're in here for this morning till coffee. And then we've got both um, panel workshops that we'll split up for and some workshops in the afternoon. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, panel number, workshop number two this afternoon, uh, which is about transforming cultural business models. Our speaker um, is coming all the way from um, Wales, which, as you may know, is now underwater quite considerably. And he's, uh, but we're getting, sta we're getting sort of stage by stage updates. It's a bit like, going to be a bit like a reality show. He's managed to leave Port Merion, you know, jokes about the white, large white bubbles, welcome. He's left Port Merion and he's got to Bangor. 
Also, no jokes, please. Um, he's got to Bangor, and now he's hoping to be able to get a train. So what we've done is, because he was on at 1.30, we're going to swap him. So um, session six is going to swap with session two, um, if he makes it. If he doesn't make it, session two might not happen. But we're going to cheer him along. So if you'd like to send him lots of positive train vibes, maybe he'll get here with a big round of applause at lunchtime. Um, final things from me. Um, those of you who weren't here yesterday, uh, I want to just draw your attention to some little signs, some um, QR codes, and the URLs that are here. Uh, the Hello Survey. We've done a short survey about some of the attitudes and ideas that we're looking at in this conference. And over, just round the corner from the banners at the back, I'm going to draw your attention to um, a nice little visualization. Uh, as people update and fill in the survey, that data will update live. It's going to ask you questions about uh, relationship versus collaboration. Are you ready? Do you have the relationships you need? And we can see how that uh, information might shift over the day as people fill the information in and maybe change what they're thinking. It's a digital conference, so like, you know, we're all over it. Yet again, yes, uh, thanks to our amazing friends at Rebel Uncut, we are live streaming. Hello, people on the live stream. Please join in. We'll be picking up your comments via Twitter. We are on Twitter. The hashtag is HelloCulture. And our Twitter name, stroke handle, is uh, at HelloCulture12. I think that's everything for right now. Um, yes, uh, at the end of each session, I will be telling you where you need to go. Um, but just as a standard thing, when I'm talking about the old library, it's here. When we're talking about the theatre, that's the theatre that's by the pool that used to be a delivery bay many years ago, uh, in the, over in the main building. And then if you've got a reference to Zelig, that's up in the penthouse where, well, it's a room just off the penthouse where we had lunch yesterday. So again, lunch will be in the penthouse. So we didn't have much of a queue for lifts, but you will have to be let up in the lift. Okay. Yesterday, I think some of the key points that were taken away, uh, certainly for me, was that there are, there, are, there, are, there are lots of ideas out there. There are some apps. There are some things that you see quite a few times. We had the IC Tomorrow Innovators yesterday. Um, and we've got some of them here today still, which is fantastic. But there's some things that, some repeated themes. There's some stuff around trails. There's stuff about enhancing a visitor experience. Um, but maybe we can start today to interrogate some other things that digital can do. Um, how can it help us, you know, build revenue models? How can it help us solve some of the other problems we might have in our organizations that aren't just about, I want more information about this artifact than, than is on the panel. That might be a challenge for us today. That might be one of the transformations we seek to employ. To kick off this morning, we have some fantastic speakers. Um, I'm very, very, um, ex I'm, I'm, I'm delighted we've got some new ideas, some, um, some new things to particularly look in terms of digital and culture. And um, our first speaker is going to be Peter Murphy-Burke. Now, Peter, as you know, spoke yesterday, um, both with an Arts Council and with a Nesta hat on. So she's back today with her Arts Council hat on. And she's going to talk us through some, uh, so, some ideas and some, uh, some opportunities around digital and culture from that basis. But you've all got packs. You can all read the biogs. So I thought to depart from that a little bit, I was very interested and I've asked everybody to give everyone who's speaking this morning to give me a little fact that we wouldn't know about them if we just read the biog or looked them up on the internet. So something that is a surprising and delightful fact about Peter. Bearing in mind I have a relatively low threshold of what I find surprising and delightful. And I'm easily surprised and, and delighted by almost anything. But um, Peter did not disappoint. 
So what you won't know about her is that at the opening of Tate Liverpool some years ago, she was a comedy lighthouse keeper. She had a comedy lighthouse uh, welded to a barge that was in the dock, uh, whereupon she kept it in a comedy fashion. I think that's uh, with some, as, you, as, as you've just said, as she just demonstrated, with some comedy gestures. If you can incorporate any of those into your talk on digital and culture, I will be additionally surprised and delighted. But um, I know it's a bit parky, but we're all going to warm up very shortly. And in particular, I've heard that if we clap really hard and really long, we'll all warm up loads. So can we warm up and give a warm welcome, please, to Peter Murphy. Thank you very much. Well, there we go. It's been about 12 months since the last Hello Culture, and we've been up to quite a bit in Arts Council with digital. Obviously, we have significant partnerships with Nesta, and I'll talk about the other partnerships that we have. I talked yesterday about grants for the arts, which is quite a blunt instrument, and we didn't know how we could apply that to digital. So I'm going to show you some of the case studies that have gone through grants for the arts in the past 12 months. And you'll see from the banner behind me, actually Arts Council are looking at digital as a real priority. So you can see that ranking at the top there. It's above visual arts and music. <laughs> So these are some of the examples of projects that we funded through Grants for the Arts. So if we have a look at CORE, did anybody go and see CORE? Hands up if any, yes, one, way, brilliant. So it was a visual arts piece that was entirely digital. So the artist, Kurt Herchlinger, had actually used digital technology and software to create the piece. This is what it looked like. So it was almost like a shoal of fish, so it was humanoid shapes it was a 50 meter long space with seven screens and uh, none of the exhibition was identical and this was the context a very very rural mu museum ironbridge gorge so they took a massive leap of faith it was the first time that they'd actually commissioned an international digital artist and i think they had 10,000 extra visitors within the first month bitjam who are here today they are a, a digital arts organisation based in North Staffordshire, and they came through Grants for the Arts for something called Geek Lab. Geek Lab was a, an online TV station. Here's an interview from Geek Lab. And here's a bit of art from Geek Lab. Nikki Pugh is an individual artist, so she um, has come in for a couple of Grants for the Arts. One was an R&D project to go to New York. <coughs> And this is the second one. So this is a GPS drawing of Corby. And how she gets these drawings is she has a colony. So these podules that you carry around with you are all teched up. So individuals get given a bit of colony, wander around, and the resulting drawing is what we've just seen. Encompass 360 was a huge project which really brought together dance and digital in the same space. So it looked like this. So it was a huge 360-degree screen. And they worked with dance uh, agency Sonia Sabri and chore choreographer Toby Norman Wright. Can you not see that very well? It's not quite dark enough in here, is it? But it is absolutely spectacular. So go on the website and have a look. And this is up at the moment. This is called Frame. It's a small visual arts, but it's looking at buying visual arts. So nothing's priced over £750. And curator Ellie Clark has put uh, work in 12 different business locations across the city. So do log on to the website and do buy, buy, buy. I think the old joint stock is, is one of the venues. Piece of artwork for sale. We've also published our creative media strategy. So it makes sense if you're coming into Grants for the Arts to have a look at the creative media strategy and use that to hang your application from. And this is our aim with the creative media strategy. So you can see we're trying to get to the very nub of digital for the cultural sector. So it is about artistic, but it's also about the economic profile and the revenue streams that can be opened up using digital. So these are our nine development areas. And I'm sure you can find a project that will fit under one of those. They're quite broad, but we do have exciting things like data and metadata in there. 
business models and organisational development. So within those nine, you should be able to find something. One of our biggest partnerships this year was with the BBC. Did anybody log on to The Space? Let's see. Oh, brilliant. Great, good. So it's a new digital platform for the arts. It was a new way of presenting work with some brilliant successes on the space. And my feeling is that there will be a space too. So do look out for the commissioning time for that. This is what it looked like. It was great on tablets, uh, good on mobile, not so good on PC. These, we've got four projects from the West Midlands. So this is Martin Parr, who's a photographer. He worked with Multi-Story to record black country stories and made these beautiful, finely crafted audio slides. So this is from a local factory. This is the World Shakespeare Festival. So that took place nationally. I think it was something like 50 different languages were used. This is Caesar. And Birmingham Opera Company, did anybody see the Stockhausen? Yes, brilliant. So it was using the whole city as a canvas. Birmingham Opera Company don't have an opera house. So they worked with helicopters, they worked in warehouses, they suspended cellists from the ceiling, and it was live streamed through the space. Very exciting project. And this was Spill. So it was Dance Exchange working in our playgrounds across the West Midlands with dancers and choreographers. They didn't tell anybody, it was kind of a pop-up um, show, so they didn't tell anybody it was going to happen. So it really engaged the community within their locality. And does anybody know what the biggest success from the space was? It was a teeny, tiny, voluntary organisation. Well, I'll give you a clue. Edible vomit? No? <laughs> Yay! There he is, the man himself. It was the John Peel archive, which is still on there, so do interrogate that and have a look. So every letter of the alphabet, we released all the bands that he'd worked with, and it was great, and his wife got involved, and it was absolutely fantastic. So I talked about partnership, and these are our partners in the next coming year. Obviously, AHRC with Nesta, the BBC. So not only are we going to be looking at space too, but also some digital capacity. So it's media training. So do, again, have a look at our website when we'll be releasing dates for that. The BFI, the British Film Institute. Obviously, we split off from, uh, Arts Council and Creative England, but we are in discussions about film and artist use of film. So keep an eye on that one. Creative England, obviously work in partnership with them because we work very closely, the sectors work closely together, and often artists cross boundaries into film. Heritage Lottery Fund, they've just released a big digital fund, and there's a lot of stuff that um, artists are doing with augmented reality and GPS and locative data around heritage sites and visual arts, I must say. And the National Archives. So we want more of this. This is from um, Happenstance, which was a Nestor R&D project. We want more of this, which is Hide and Seek. And a bit more of that, which is Art Finder, where they've tagged every single uh, painting in local authority control, so you can have a look at that at your own leisure. So that's us. Do test the fund and come and talk to me if you want to look at a digital project around Grants for the Arts because we're really proactively pushing this as an area and a priority for Arts Council. So thank you very much. Unless there are some burning questions for Peter right now, what I, what I propose we do is that we listen to all three uh, keynote speakers and then there will be some time for Q&A at the end. Is that okay? Is that okay? Can I build a consensus about that? Is that okay? I need, I need more visible nodding. It'll warm you up. Thank you. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. So next up, we have Hassan Bakshi from Nesta. Um, I mean, it's ever so, I mean, have you read his biog? It's ever so impressive, isn't it? I mean, there's, you know, Lehman Brothers, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Bank of England, Nesta. It's all very, but you know, did I find that surprising and delightful? Well, it's impressive, but no. What's surprising and delightful about uh, Hassan is he is obsessed with flamenco music. He, to the point where he nearly moved to Spain. That's brilliant, I think. Um, but, he can't, but he won't be demonstrating any. Do you, play, you don't play guitar, you just listen. Do you play at all? 
done dabbled in the past, but dabbled. That yeah. means it's really good. No, it doesn't. <laughs> You don't work at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and, and Lehman Brothers and then dabble in something you're not brilliant at. <laughs> Word of the wise. So, uh, but Spain's loss, I think you'll agree, is, our, is going to be our gain. Um, Hassan is going, uh, Director of Creative Economy at Nesta, is going to talk to us about um, transforming culture through experimentation. And I think like transformation, apart from the fact it ends in A-T-I-O-N. It's another of those words that we sort of go, yeah, 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 we want to do that. No, we don't really. So I would be really welcome. Um, I think we, we're, we're going to welcome your comments, your thoughts, and your insights on this. And can we all welcome Hassan now as he gives his next talk. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, while that may seem a bit of a a random sort of background, and uh, you might be wondering, what, what, why am I talking about uh, digital, digital transform transformation and culture? I mean, the common thing in my background is I'm, I'm basically a researcher, um, but I guess I've always been interested in research questions, which are uh, ones which could, you know, in, in addressing them, can sort of impact on change. So this sort of rather... Uh, Nesta tends to attract quite a, a large group of disparate people with very different backgrounds, physicists, musicians, and economists like myself who... Um, I suppose in various ways have had either midlife or sort of early uh, sort of uh, mid, you know, midlife crises. Uh, when I was at Lehman Brothers, I basically left to try and produce films, and then I found that within a few weeks of having started doing that, I was analysing the film production process, and uh, and I sort of gave up on the idea of actually uh, being a creative and sticking to my my love, I suppose, and hopefully I've got some something to contribute, which is analysis. So. Um, it does seem odd to be talking about transforming culture through experimentation, when experimentation is the modus operandi of the arts. And yet the evidence suggests that in the main, the arts have not been ambitious in responding to the opportunities that disruptive digital technologies present. And understanding why and exploring what the obstacles might be um, should be a big priority. Now, based on what is known about technology adoption and diffusion in society more generally, and the experience of working with cultural institutions, we've proposed that the absence of a social infrastructure for capturing and sharing lessons from experiments is a major barrier to the innovative use of digital uh, technologies. And this is a gap that the digital R&D funds are trying to fill. It's actually quite um, surprising to think that despite decades of sustained attack by scholars on science and technology-driven understandings of innovation, that the vast majority of public funding for R&D is still channeled through science and technology instruments. And I'm thinking over here things like the R&D tax credit, uh, worth uh, over a billion pounds a year, technology strategy board grants, which add up to 300 million pounds or so, um, with the exceptions of work that of, of I see tomorrow. That's primarily focused on science and technology. Um, we have a patent box that's just about to appear in the UK. Again, it's estimated that will be worth over a billion pounds. So there's an awful lot of money going into R&D but very little of it by design, making it into the arts. To give an example here, if you look at the, if you go into the HMRC, uh, the uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs website, and if you're interested in how the R&D tax credit works, you'll find the following quote. Your company or organization can only claim for R&D relief if an R&D project seeks to achieve an advance in overall knowledge or capability in a field of science or technology through the resolution of scientific and technological uncertainty. Science does not include work in the arts, humanities, and the social sciences. Now, the official definitions of R&D, laid down by the OECD in Paris, characterize it as being composed of basic research, or fundamental research, to acquire knowledge without an application in mind. Second, applied research, where knowledge creation has specific practical aims. And third, experimental development, which draws on research to produce new products, processes, and systems. This has probably, probably always been a simplification of what actually goes on in science and technology research. But even so, the clarity of these definitions has given rise to measurement guidelines and agreed R&D metrics, which have enabled analysts to explore, for example, the relationship between spend on R&D and performance of the organization, and R&D spending and national performance at the macro level. A large body of empirical evidence has been gathered, which suggests that investments in R&D by individual businesses generate positive spillovers, positive spillovers on innovation in other firms. And this is what con uh, constitutes what economists call a market failure, which justifies public funding in R&D. 
Now, absent clear definitions of R&D, experimental development and innovation in the arts, agreement on why these things are actually socially desirable, lacking understandings of how arts organizations invest in innovation, metrics and ways of evaluating the returns from this investment, is it any surprise that funders have not devoted more money to it? Now, this was the backdrop to the experimental research collaboration with the National Theatre and the Tate that David Throsby and I initiated in 2008 and which culminated in the Culture of Innovation report in 2010. We'd noticed that funders in the UK were increasingly speaking about the importance of innovation in the arts. And these two quotes from Sir Brian McMaster's report, which you'll remember, for the DCMS uh, back in 2008, were typical. Those who fund the arts and those in receipt of funding have a duty to continuously encourage innovation. The boards of cultural organisations, and I include museums and galleries in my understanding of this, are or should be the guardians of innovation and risk-taking. Now, these recommendations were all well and good. The only problem was that no one really knew what was meant by innovation. Brian's report gained little traction as a result, beyond his recommendation that instrumental motives for public support for the arts should be replaced with something else, with that something else being innovation, which interestingly places it in the same unexplained bucket as so-called intrinsic reasons for supporting the arts. Now, in Culture of Innovation, we sought to take a first step in clarifying what is meant by innovation in the arts and culture, and identified the response to digital technologies as a central cross-cutting theme. The resulting study focused on four areas of potential innovation. First, what we called art form development, the development of new work that has at least the potential to influence artistic trends and perhaps lead them in new directions altogether. Second, audience reach, made up of audience broadening. By that, I mean capturing a larger share of the, the population segment known already to be traditional participants, but who currently do not attend. Audience deepening, which is about intensifying the current participants' level of involvement, measured, for example, by the number of attendances per individual per year or by the degree of audience engagement with the art form itself. And audience diversifying, which is about attracting new groups of consumers who would not otherwise attend. This is the, uh, the access agenda. A third area of potential innovation was in value creation. And what we meant by this was new ways in which a cultural institution can create value, whether or not that is mediated in the market. And lastly, business model innovation, uh, by which we meant changes in financial models or in organisational processes which support these new ways of creating value. We found in the case of the National Theatre uh, that live broadcasts of plays to cinema achieved a striking extension of audience reach. Although NT Live appeared to have attracted very few novices in theatre, this larger audiences did include a significant minority whose incomes were lower than those attending theatrical performances at the South Bank, thus suggesting an attractive digital route to serving a more diverse audience. There was no evidence at all that the screenings had cannibalised the theatre box office. On the contrary, the live broadcasts appear to have positively recruited audiences to the national by tapping into the local audience networks of cinemas. On the theme of advancing art forms, the study provided indicative insights about the relative levels of emotional engagement of cinema and theatre goers in the experiment challenging the assumption that in the, in the flesh live is necessarily always the most engaging. And with regard to innovation in value creation, the research explored concepts like willingness to pay, willingness to donate for the virtual experience of a gallery exhibition, adding insights for voluntary and crowdfunding methods. Now NT Live, as we all know, has gone from strength to strength and is now an established part of the UK's cultural scene. But of course, there are many, many good examples of other performing arts organisations pushing the boundaries of digital. National Theatre Wales, a company with no fixed physical, physical base and formed only in 2010, has as its core mission engagement with audiences through a combination of social media and on-the-ground engagement with communities to establish physical audiences and performance sites. You'll all know about National Theatre Wales street performance in Port Talbot of The Passion, starring Michael Sheen, which was webcast live and has been widely hailed as an artistic and social triumph. And it also yielded unanticipated economic benefits, including, I understand, a boost for the hyperlocal Port Talbot Magnet News service, which was created by the journalists uh, following the closure of the local newspaper. So Wales, of course, also provides illustrations of the difficulties many arts organisations encounter in dealing with digital. Audiences that talk theatre in Milford, Milford Haven, one of the most remote cultural centres in the UK, can today, today enjoy live performances from New York Metropolitan Opera, but not from the Cardiff-based Welsh National Opera because of contractual issues. Now, the momentum created by cultural innovation and other experimental studies led to the decision by the Arts Council, the AHRC and NESTA to fund a half a million pound 
R&D fund for the arts and culture in England. And this, as you uh, would have heard yesterday from Peter, has been followed up by a three-year scheme worth over £7 million. Nestor is also working with Creative Scotland and the AHRC in piloting the digital R&D fund in Scotland, and we're thinking about doing the same in Wales too. I think uh, you probably already heard a bit about the mechanics of the fund. I won't go into that now. Uh, all I will say is that, you know, this is, uh, you know, applications, the, co the co competition is live, so please, uh, please put your applications in. Um, with the pilot fund, many of you all know that we were, we were over inundated with, with applications. Uh, we had uh, over 400, well, around 400 eligible applications chasing a very small pot of funds. And we had to turn down a very, very large number of fundable projects. So uh, the, the, really the main message I wanted to give is please, please apply. Now, I'm not going to go into the mechanics of the fund. It's all on the website and I'm around all day if anyone wants to ask. But what I wanted to do was um, give some new reflections on uh, one or two uh, time permitting. Uh, of the uh, projects that we supported in the fund. And um, there's a lot of rhetoric, and I, I wasn't here yesterday, about the, you know, the importance of failing. Um, Nesta uh, yesterday held its first uh, um, failure fest, and I was hearing from Jane that uh, uh, this is not an unknown um, sort of uh, concept in the arts. Um, I'm looking forward to going to the one that Jane's going to be organising next year. Um, but one of the things, of course, I don't know about you, but it can be very frustrating and a bit tired hearing about the importance of failing, because... Um, uh, you know, there are obvious constraints uh, in organisations standing up and talking about what's failed, not least um, if they're looking, if the funders are in the audience. So what I wanted to do was give a couple of case studies of, um, uh, of projects which really um, haven't gone at all according to plan, which is a fair description of every single one of the projects we piloted. Um, with one exception, perhaps, um, none of our projects have turned out uh, according, to, according to plan. Um, and the first one I wanted to talk about was Punch Drunk. Now, Punch Drunk is a British theatre company um, specialising, as you know, in immersive experiences. By Punch Drunk's own description, these can literally leave participants reeling. With its shows usually being sold out, it was an obvious candidate to explore ways that technology might be used to expand the virtual capacity of a live performance arts organisation. But this was never going to be straightforward. Punch Drunk itself describes its productions as unrecordable because video fails to show how the audience chooses its own path. More interesting, it was thought, and much more challenging, would be to create links between members of the live audience and the online community in order to share the emotional and immersive experience. In effect, Punch Drunk wanted to create an entirely new theatrical experience based on mixed reality, the live performance linked with the online experience. The question was whether they could offer an online participant anything to match the quality of the interactive live experience that is at the heart of all their immersive work. Now, Punch Drunk had two important assets that it could bring uh, into this R&D project. A well-received production of Sleep No More in New York and a working relationship with MIT Media Lab, that's the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The project's objectives had been to create an online platform that creates links to a live production, in this case the production being Sleep No More, to allow online individuals to partner with selected audience members to provide a unique and interactive experience for both and enable a wider audience to interact with the process via the website and social media. Because the project was built around an extension of an existing production, care had to be taken to build in discrete communication technology, both on set and with selected members of the audience, so that this would not disrupt the performance. A new storyline also needed to be developed within the production to provide a trail, clues and, and items for discovery, all of which form the content of this mixed reality experience. Decisions had to be taken about how physical and online worlds would interact. Would they be in sync? Would they communicate with pictures or texts or sounds? In other words, how could the online world become a faithful reimagining of the world of this production? The decision was made to focus on paired online and real world participants who, over a three hour period, would work together to discover a hidden narrative. They would connect through technology integrated into selected versions of the masks that all audience members wore and at a series of discreetly installed portals embedded in the space. The online interface would offer a more digital version of the world of Sleep No More for participants to explore and a location-based system that would allow them to track movement and progress. Now, the technical challenges of creating this network meant that the objective of sharing the online experience with a wider audience had to be shelved halfway through the project. The team realised that they could not predict the quality of the mixed reality experience in any of this, its first incarnation. It would therefore be impractical to open it up to observers, although that remains an important long-term goal for Punch Drunk's work. 
For the more limited project, a much smaller number of individuals were recruited for both the real world and the online world. They included punch-drunk groupies, online enthusiasts who were familiar with video games, and others who were completely new to both. Punch Drunk's existing relationship with MIT Media Lab had been strengthened through the development of the project, and clearly this could not have happened without their expertise. This project wouldn't have happened. However, the experience also raised issues about the difficulties of relying on a geographically distant technology team. Punch Drunk has come to recognize the importance of a senior technology lead based within the company itself. The project itself was tested over a week of performances of Sleep No More in New York in May. Managing the array of technological innovations proved very challenging and sustained the mixed reality relationships became dependent on two very important operators from the media lab. And this hadn't been anticipated uh, how important this role would be. Even so, the first night attempt to pair five audience members with five online participants had to be scaled back very considerably to two the following night. In all, just 28 participants participated in the experiment, which was a much smaller number than originally anticipated. Of these, 14 were audience participants in this special version of Sleep No More with the equipment to communicate with their online partners. And in this sense, they had a quite different, more purposeful experience than the usual audience member. They were, it turned out, less likely to become immersed in this ritual quality of the production, in, in the typical ritual quality of Sleep No More's productions. And this distancing applied even more so to the online participants who are interacting with their partners through laptops from homes or from their offices. So how successful was this experiment? A key outcome was that many participants felt that they had barely scratched the surface of this experience or that they had felt lost and disconnected. This was in part due to the difficulties of stimulating, simulating the experience of real-world audiences who are usually prepared before the performance for the ritual nature of the event and are similarly disengaged at the end. For the online participants, it seems, the process felt much more re remote and abrupt. Their experience also had to be mediated by the operators that I mentioned, real people who were standing in for the uncreated interactive fiction engine. In a fully realized operation, the online participants might have automatically triggered a host of rich media that simulated the world of sleep no more. The project's researchers from the University of West England and Dundee identified a tendency by the online participants to slip into a game-playing role rather than accepting what was more of an open-ended exploratory experience. It led to the question of whether the online experience should have been constructed as a goal-driven game from the outset. But importantly, this would have been at odds with uh, the actual experience of Sleep No More. And it, wasn't, it was explicitly not an intention of Punch Drunk to, to create a game. Now, clearly, this highly experimental and ambitious digital engagement with a live production did not work out as planned. But there is a huge amount to be learned from the project, and these lessons will need to be absorbed by Punch Drunk and any other organization that's attempting to reproduce the emotional engagement of live performance through digital media. The main practical lessons include, first, that technical ambition is to be welcomed, but it has to accommodate significant time to test equipment and systems. Second, that the researchers observed that the relationship between the operator and the audience seemed to have emerged as the most exciting and playful part of the experience. However, this complex intermediary role is a significant limitation to scaling up a mixed reality project. Third, the ambitious objectives of a single project evolved into the complex creation of, in effect, three different projects. The online world, the physical world of the live space with portals through to the online audience, and the knitting together of the two. Audience, of the two. And unsurprisingly, this was beyond the available resources and timescale. Fourthly, the internal company developments for Punch Drunk have been very considerable. They have identified the need for, need for a senior digital specialist in, in the team, and they have begun to learn how to integrate communications technology into their productions. As Pete Higgin, Enrichment Director of Punch Drunk, says, bridging the void between the live show and your home computer or laptop and creating an experience that immerses your body and mind in the same way as a live production is still some way, some way, some way away. We feel the project was an important starting point and are now beginning to develop ways in which we could create distinct and companion pieces of and for our work. I think in, given the time, I, I was planning to take you through a second very, very different project that Peter mentioned earlier, um, which is the Happenstance project. Um, but I, th I think um, I'm probably running out of time here, aren't I? So I think what I'll do is it'll, it'll move to some general reflections on what we've learned from the projects. So it has to be said that having experienced projects such as Punch Drunks, but also Happenstances, I'm more convinced than ever of the social value of disciplined experiments with technologies in the arts. None of the projects supported in the England pilot, as I mentioned earlier, with arguably one exception, which is the LSO uh, project, which is a, 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 a ticketing app. None of the projects uh, turned out as anticipated. 
And yet, as R&D projects, this is exactly what we'd expect. In fact, one in eight is actually not at all a bad hit rate for R&D. Several of the organizations participating in the fund claim that the space it created to take genuine risks enabled them to experiment in a way which otherwise just would not have been possible. Over the coming three years, when the fund will perhaps fund, uh, support 90 to 100 digital R&D projects, it is tantalizing to think that some of them may have a chance of genuinely transforming how audiences engage with culture. But I think that would be to understate the main benefits of R&D, which are to help arts organizations manage the uncertainties associated with the use of unfamiliar technologies through experimentation and shared learning so that the same mistakes are not made twice. And over above all of this, the individual R&D projects should, in my view, be seen as small moves in a much bigger game, the ultimate prize for which is an understanding of innovation that is better grounded in the economy and society of today. Arts and culture organizations should aspire to and be funded to engage in research and experimental development, which aims at innovation in all its forms, addressing the long-standing imbalances that I've mentioned exist in innovation policy. Experimental development will trial new ways of engaging audiences and will test new business models as the technologies evolve. It will also help arts and cultural organizations reimagine their relationship with private businesses, social enterprises, public service delivery, and so on, which could give rise to altogether new forms of value. Thank you. As you probably heard from my a spontaneous explosion of laughter when you said arts boards should be the guardians of innovation. I might not agree with everything that's just... <laughs> I think you've given us lots of really interesting things to talk about, and I've, I've got some questions, even if you guys haven't. That's good, isn't it? Um, so thank you very much for that, Hassan. Um, I think there is a lot in there about what we actually talk... what we mean when we say innovation... Um, the culture of failure, in particular, I think, for arts organizations, when you are funded, that courage to say, yeah, we got funded to do this, and it absolutely did not turn out the way we thought it was going to. And in terms of its original plan, it was a bit of a disaster. Oh, but it's all right, really, because we've learned this. I don't know how many people have the courage to be really honest with funders and talk to them in that way. But that could just be me. Um, our third speaker. A spooky theme started to emerge. Because before Hassan had mentioned that he really loved flamenco, Jane Finnis from Culture 24 said, oh, I can't think of anything. Although I do love flamenco and it's my secret desire to go on Strictly Come Dancing. And she went, although not that secret because I tell everybody. <laughs> um, so we were then trying to speculate how she could get on Strictly. She was saying, I don't know how I can become famous enough, like in five years, to get on Strictly. So I posited that maybe instead of being a celebrity, she could try and become Before professional. I'm too old, so I can't win, of course. All oh, right. Well, there's that, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, we thought about celebrity. We talked about daytime telly host, like a Jackie Finnegan, you know, Jackie, whatever, Judy Finnegan. But then I, I thought, MP. And she said, ah, don't want to join a political party. So... I'm here to confidently predict that when we do Hello Culture 2017, we'll be having Jane back on, fresh from her eviction on Strictly, <laughs> after being uh, the, the, the UK's first independent MP, to be in, invited on the show. <laughs> so there's a transformation, if ever there was one. I, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> so that said... Jane Finnis is Chief Executive of Culture24, and that's an independent charity supporting the arts and heritage sector. Uh, and I don't know if you've had a chance to read the Let's Get Real report, but it is a very, very refreshing and insightful read. Uh, spoiler alert, you might get a chance to read it later today, because uh, Jane's brought some with her. But I know that she'll have some really interesting uh, things for us to share. And on top of the other two... Um, uh, other two speakers, I think we'll get a really complete picture and a really uh, good basis for our discussion. So can we all please welcome Jane? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, apart from being obsessed with Strictly, I, I, do, I have a bit of a problem actually with all this talk of digital innovation um, and new business models and technology solutions. Um, I feel that often digital technologies are sold to the cultural sector as solutions for, you know, cuts in funding or lack of growth 
or audience impact or financial sustainability to services. Um, and the, the truth is that the problems online um, and success online goes much deeper. There's often, uh, I think, a lack of clarity in the online offer of cultural organisations um, and a, a kind of wishful hope that, that the online world is somehow going to democratise all their assets and that the web is going to reach everybody and bring in lots of new money and loads of new audiences just by kind of putting stuff out there. Um, and I think we're, we're all guilty of fetishising technology a bit when actually it's the content and the culture itself that we need to sort of obsess over. Um, and it's time to get real about some of this stuff. Um, I, I think organisations need to go back to their mission, um, find clarity of purpose online in the same way that they do it often in their physical spaces. Um, the what it is, what is it that you're trying to do and who it is for. Um, and we need to unpack what we're doing online and understand its value better. Um, and we need to be able to answer this question, who cares? Who actually cares about the stuff that we're doing? Um, so I want to talk about attention share online, um, and I'm talking about it in the context of, cult of uh, cultural organisations' websites. Um, so we all know, because we all go online, that the web is actually dominated by sort of sport and news and gossip and social media and shopping and porn. You know, that's what is really actually happening. And cultural institutions are nowhere in this scale. So as part of the research we did, looking at in June uh, 2011, using Hitwise, um, looking at UK domestic traffic to cultural websites, we took the top 40 institutions in the UK, so the big ones, um, uh, you know, kind of Tate British Museum and the Royal Opera House and the National Archives and, and National Museum of Wales and Scotland, took, took them all, top 40, added together all the traffic to their websites um, in one month. Um, and what do you think the percentage was of those 40, top 40 cultural institutions of overall UK domestic traffic? Anybody want to guess? Any yeah. other bids? Yeah, okay. Between well, five and less than there one. There you go, zero, less than 0 0.04. Okay, so, I mean, you were closest, but you're, that's still quite a big difference. Um, that's about the same equivalent size in that month of littlewoods.com. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's UK domestic traffic, and obviously Hitwise has its problems, but even if it's 50% wrong, or even if it's 90% wrong, it's still absolutely awful. Anyway, so looking at the Taking Part survey from this year, um, uh, which looks at the overall population visiting uh, different museum, gallery, theatre websites. Okay, so the, the green is percentage of population in 0506, and the blue is the percentage of population in 1112. So the first one's museums, second one's heritage, second one's theatre. They're all going up. That's nice, isn't it? No, it's not, because that's the growth in the, in the percentage of the population online. So it's, the number of people online is growing, and even though your own traffic is going up, your, percent, your attention share is going down. So we're actually declining. Okay. So I've been investigating all these things as a part of a series of action research projects that I've been leading at Culture. 24 called Let's Get Real. It started two years ago with a group of people who wanted to know how to evaluate success online, how, how to understand what success is and get better at it. Um, so these are the people in 2011, and Linda's here, hello Linda. Um, and from these organizations, um, and we worked together on the first phase, and these are the people in the, in the current project from these organizations. Um, oh, did I? Yep, and we're uh, currently in the middle of phase two, reports coming out probably in the spring and we'll have uh, a second conference to look at that. Um, and that's the report. And I've got my prop. I bought, I bought these up, so I'm not taking them back, so please help yourself. Okay, so um, overall, uh, over the kind of time that we've been doing it, there's um, some, obs you know, some observations I've got about what, what organizations are struggling with. Um, and they're trying to work out from the mass of all the analytics and data that they've got, the difference between what is interesting and what is actually useful. Because it's all interesting and you can, you know, if you have a Google Analytics account, I mean, you can sit and watch the live traffic, which is really interesting, but it isn't actually very useful if you're, in, in, you're trying to actually make decisions about what to do. 
um, that the, the people are trying to find the right data to tell the right story, to drive organizational change. So to actually learn, to get value, and to argue internally that what they're doing and what the successes are, and trying to find the right data to do that, to offer evidence to the leadership that is informed, informed from actual practice um, and uh, evidence, um, and that reflects on the work and how to improve it, and crucially, to promote the fact that digital needs to be a part of their overall organizational strategy that it's just a tactic that serves the mission. It's not a strategy on its own. Um, they're all struggling to understand their constraints and how they contribute to their failures. And these might be legacies of technical systems. They might be internal politics to do with your part of a local authority. They might be to do with your pro procurement procedures, the way in which you can actually contract work. They might be because you can't deal with an agile type of development, which is what you have to do if you're going to do anything online. Um, it would be more iterative. Um, and and I, it's, I think it's very important to remember when you talk about failure that it isn't a failure if you know it's happening. It's only a failure if you're ignoring it because then it really is a failure. If you know it's happening, then it's a learning. Um, and that uh, with public funding, we need honesty around uh, failure. Uh, and it's just not welcomed. It's not welcomed in the, in strategically at all. Um, and, we, and we have to have honest evaluation if we're actually going to get better, I think. So, um, with all the Let's Get Real work, we've sent everybody back to mission, seeking clarity of purpose, and it's not good enough to say generic things about your online offer like great art for everyone, or inspire learning on our collections, that you have to be specific. You have to have a target audience, impact, learning, you have to understand the effect, and you need to know what kind of behaviors you want to engender and in who, specifically, really specifically. Um, just like you would do if you were putting on an exhibition or a theatre show. It's, you go, it, people understand that in the physical space, and I don't know what happens when it gets online. It just, they forget, or they're not allowed to, or whatever. So, in Let's Get Real, we've been trying to understand through the research the differences between uh, popularity and engagement. So really sort of simple things. And the research we've showed, done, and when I talk about popularity, I mean things like the number of people who come to you because they've heard of you. So brand searching, the number of likes you get, the sort of basic stuff around do people know who you are, um, versus engagement, which is actually conversational or participatory, okay? Um, and the research that we've done with these organizations, there's a direct relationship between the amount of money they spend and their popularity which sort of makes sense, you know, you, it's like it's marketing 101, you know, you have lots of money, you can do lots of marketing, people have heard of you. Um, but there isn't the same relationship between high levels of engagement um, and spend. So the people who were the most successful around engaging content were the ones who had successfully found a niche piece of content with a niche audience, the right thing in the right time. So it was very small, might be small, but it was very engaged. Targeted content at targeted audiences. Um, and the guy yesterday from Kickstarter who was saying that the projects that work well are the ones that do that. So it's, it's the same, same story. Um, uh, on the whole, as a sector, we're not particularly good at popularity. Um, unless you already have a brand, like the, you know, you're the Tate or the you know, British Museum or somebody. Um, and we've either got to get, if we're going to deal with popularity, we've either got to get better at building our own brands, which is often about money, um, and that, and it's hard. Even if you have money, it's hard. Even the organizations who are born digital, who do this all the time and have money, it's hard. Um, I mean, it, I think there's an inter interesting parallel with the, um, if you look at somebody like the, Gar the Guardian, the kind of newspapers, who come from a sort of similar institutional background to museums and galleries, they're struggling. They're still riddled with all the institutional politics that museums and galleries are. Um, uh, but they're still finding it difficult. They've got great content, but they're, still, they're not still making money. They haven't got a business model that works. So and we're kind of going, well, thinking that we can invent something. Uh, and I'm very skeptical about that. Um, so, or, or we could. We could work together to build shared brands around our stuff. Maybe that might work. Um, you know, maybe the brand isn't culture. Maybe the brand is archaeology or porcelain or, or photography. Um, and Culture 24 have done a little, some, some work in this area around the Museums at Night campaign that we run, which is a shared umbrella brand that has, is free to participate, and it has a very clear USP. So the idea, it's an it's a annual uh, showcase of late night openings, happens in May all over the country. Um, and the idea is you open late, you do something different, and you attract a different 
audience as a result. Very simple, and we've had some success in building a kind of shared brand around that idea, which, is, which the public seem to like. Or you could sort of forget about your brand and popularity and focus on engagement and think about, identify what is the right kind of engagement, what are those behaviours that you want, um, and create something that, that uh, uh, create something that fits actual user behaviour and desires and might be meaningful to people. Okay, so I want to leave you by um, advocating three things, um, three simple things that, that we can do to boost attention share online. And this is really simple, basic stuff. And if you know this, well done, that's brilliant. And, and I apologize for preaching to the converted. But um, the first one is examine your purpose of the organization. Seek clarity online and be really specific about your audience. If you can find that niche and it is a genuine niche that reflects your actual content, then it will be easy and it will ring true for audiences. It will, it will, they, they, they'll feel the passion that you have for what you, you do. Um, and that we need to be bold here, I think, as a sector, about our voice and our personality in these niches. We can own these subjects. We are the experts in this stuff. Um, just like we are in the physical world, we can do the same things online. And it might be small, it might be local, it might be really social, it might be age-specific, it might be subject-specific. It doesn't really matter if it's, as long as it's genuine to you. Um, we need to think about our planning online like we do in, with the physical presence. Um, and uh, this, you know, the same way that targeted exhibitions and shows do something special for a particular group. We get this, you know, people who, are, who have, you know, uh, heritage places for uh, steam trains have steam enthusiasts, and that's okay, you know, and we can do the same sort of thing um, as that. Okay, the second one is think about SEO, search engine optimization. The research that we've done is, is still 50 to 70% of traffic comes from search, Really few organizations, cultural organizations, ever think about it, spend any money on it, do anything about it. And if you've got your niche sorted, it's really easy to optimize on that niche. It's really easy, and it doesn't actually cost that much money. In fact, it's sometimes it doesn't cost anything. It's all about how you do write the content. And then the last one, um, and this might be very unpopular, if you're planning an app, stop it. Just don't do it. I mean, if the answer is an app, what is the question? <laughs> I mean, really, it's, I just don't get it. Um, uh, it's complicated, it eats money, it's driven by brand rather than need often. It's like we have to have an app, everyone else has got one. Um, and the research that we've done from the Let's Get Real work shows that the traffic to cultural institutions' websites from mobile in the last year has grown by like 150%. So people are coming to your site from a mobile device, and very few people have a mobile-friendly website. Sort that out first. Just do that. You know, and then you're solving a problem, not creating a new problem, but having this app. And that would be real innovation, I think, that. Okay? Um, and then just the last thing, uh, to leave on a sort of more positive note, uh, that, you know, to remember that technology has changed the way that we do almost everything, um, but actually transformative power for audiences is actually in the content. It's not in the technology. I'm done now. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. That, thank you. That's really great. And okay, I'll fess up. Who wants an app? Who wants an app? Because they want a lovely little square thing on their phone that's like theirs. That's really why. I, do I really want an app? No, but I'd love to go, oh, look. But if you make a good mobile-friendly site, you, you can yeah. have it so that it, it creates an app. You can make it so it makes a, a, a square. I only want the square. You don't Frankly, need an you can app. have the square can, with nothing behind you can it. Have I just want the square, square from a mobile-friendly website, can't you? It has a little thing. It pops up and it says, add this to your, to your desktop or homepage or whatever it's called. Wow. Heard it here first. I don't know why I host a technology conference. I've got no knowledge of it whatsoever. I can barely, <laughs> I can barely use the phone. I have questions, but you've heard enough from me. Uh, have we got questions or comments for any or all of our panelists? Don't be shy. We have a roving mic. Do we have a roving mic? Oh, we do have a roving mic, yes. Gentleman at the front. I love this. This is my David, this is my David Dimbleby moment. Gentleman in the front. Lovely glasses. <laughs> Thank you very much. Simon Kane, Birmingham Museums Trust. I, it's a comment, really. We've heard quite a bit about failing. I will, unfortunately, I wasn't here yesterday. 
and I wanted to reflect on Jane's comment. Um, the sector I work in, partly, which is conservation, has a real issue, again, because it's about professional credibility. To stand up and say you're failing is not really a good career move. But if you look at other sectors, such as the aero industries and the medical sectors, they actually have systems by which they can reflect on failures, because failures in their industries are really serious. I mean, a failure in our sector might be that we don't quite get the audience numbers, but generally theirs end up with Maybe people dying. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> And I thought your point was well made, that actually it's, de it's not failure per se, it's degrees, it's understanding mm. if you haven't achieved what you wanted to achieve, why you haven't achieved mm. that, and learning from the process. And that, that was really my main comment, and that's the attitude that we try and take, is that it's learning from the process and seeing how we can improve from it, rather than see it as an out-and-out -out failure. Because I suspect there are very, very few projects um, that actually fail outright. Oh, no, they exactly they will fail in part. So I just think, yeah. Well, there's, that, there's a management mantra that says there is no failure, only feedback. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's something that we, that having, having things in absolute terms, and, it, and you're right, if there's, in terms of medical research, you know, how much have we spent on finding a cure for, you know, various cancers? Well, we've not found it, but then we're going, forget that, not reinvesting in that. Failures, all of them. Your thoughts. Um, actually, Peter, can I just, in terms of the arts, kind of, I think uh, I speak as somebody with a grants for the arts application pending as we, you know, as we sit here. Just remember that helps. Yeah, is that quite, yes. <laughs> Do you, uh, what, not what's the best way to present failure as in what's the spin to put it on it, but do you, th uh, my sense is that that funding organisations are a bit more mature about that, particularly in the area of digital. Is that, have you got any thoughts or reflections on that? Um, well, we quite like the under 10K pots because that's a quite a risky pot. So if you come in for your first application or you want to pilot something, you want to try something, then under 10K is a good place to do it. But we don't actually evaluate failure effectively on our yeah. website. We have artistic failure, we have economic failure, and we have capital failures. So we're not very open about that, and it's something that we need to interrogate more. But I think within the digital space, there's plenty of time to, for failure. Good to hear. Could I just actually quickly add to that? I, I think um, uh, I, I really agree, incidentally, that, that it's the absence of a system that we see in other areas, um, which is one of the priorities for funders, is to try and build those systems. And that's why you need the partnerships of the, you know, the knowledge universities and to, to build that, those systems and build a language and, and everything, all the baggage that goes with a system. I mean, it's actually quite a lot, you know. R&D is, you know, it's, it was a child of the science lobby back in the, you know, post-war period when the science settlement was under threat and it's had 56, and it's got a manual, right? I mean, which is great. I mean, it's, you know, what, why, haven't, why haven't we attempted to try and codify systems for experimentation in the arts? It's not to try and take any, demystify the arts or take any the mystery out of it and the magic out of it, but, but why not? So I think I really, really agree with that. On the point about funders, obviously I'm not, I don't, Nesta doesn't, we're not really, a, was, I mean, we used to be more of a funder before, as you know, we become a charity, and if, if anything, actually, we're looking for fund, funds, funds now to do the work we do. Um, but we, um, the one thing I would say is, in terms of my experience of working with, you know, Arts Council, uh, Credit Scotland, etc., is there are, it's rare to see a proposal which has a very sort of um, has built in an evaluation strategy into the project. Right. I mean, and when you see it, your eyes light up, you know. Um, yeah. And it's not rocket science either. I'm not saying like randomised control trials and all this sort of thing, you know. I mean, but it, it, it's about having a very clear sense in the design of the project about. If it fails, why that's not a failure for the funder, because it, you know, and that I think there's a lot of good, a lot of low-hanging fruit, frankly, because there's a, you know, we struggle to get. Would you agree yeah, with that, Peter? Right. Yeah. The, I, I, the, re the reason I said that there's lots of failures is um, is because I really genuinely believe that there are, and I think that the reason that they're failures is because they don't know what success is supposed yes. to look like. Mm -hmm. So yeah. therefore, yeah. how do you know whether you've done it or not? Yeah. So it might, be, it might be that they're really successful, but if you don't know what you're trying to do, how do you know if you've done it? Yeah. So, and, mm -hmm. that, and, I'm don't, and I'm not pressing for people to, to judge everything on value that's financial. I think you can articulate the value socially or educationally or in terms of brand awareness or whatever you want it to be. Or, or even organisationally. It, it might yeah. be, we're doing this because we want to try it out and yeah. we want to learn and that's our, that, we want to be the organisation who are first to do this. That's legitimate. I mean, Tate have met, they've done that yeah. all the time. You know, they push yeah. them for that and some small organisations do that and that's great. But unless you know what it is 
and that the Arts Council have got much better, I think, at pressing for that yeah. in the, their general funding, and it, that I don't, just don't see that rigour in any of the digital funds at all. Yeah. Another question. Je um, Jen oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, right. Pepita, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Hello, Pepita Hanna from Birmingham Ormiston Academy, the brand new regional academy for 40 to 19 year olds in digital, creative, and performing arts. And two of our students are here today. Um, I'm fascinated in the thing that you identified, Jane, with the difference between the virtual audiences and the real audiences. Because as we know, in many sectors, actually the audience numbers for the arts and culture are increasing. So I'm fascinated by that. Have you done any, um, do you, can you drill down into that virtual audience to know um, what kinds of groups are accessing the information? The, the HIPMISE does demographic um, information and the demographics that were looking at the cultural websites were exactly the same demographics as the people that go. So the people who come to your museum and gallery are the ones that like you on Facebook okay. uh, and the ones that visit your website. And there was very little evidence that new audiences were coming through the cultural websites. I mean, I think that a lot of the new audiences, particularly the younger people, exactly will, uh, you know, it's, it's the whole sort of social media boom. You don't need to, it happens without you, basically. So people talk about and share information, and it's got nothing to do with your website. They might talk about something you're doing or share something you've done, and never ever, and no one will ever go to your website. It's just portable in, if you're lucky, it's portable and viral, and that the best thing you can do is just to make everything as shareable as possible and hope that people do. Mm -hmm. But we did lots of things where we tracked um, links back through people's own Twitter accounts to, as referrals, and then you do that thing where you can use bit.ly links and you can track how many times it's been shared in social media that isn't via you. And it was like, you know, five to ten were from people's own accounts. And then sometimes there was like 100, 100 you know, 150 of, of shares that had gone on beyond that outside of your control. Mm. And that's really what you want to see. It's actually. the viral word of mouth, isn't it, effectively? Yeah, kind of. It's like, you know, that yeah. if it's interesting, people will share it if, it, if you tell them in the right mm. place. So it needs to be quite targeted for specific audiences, young yeah, people, older people? Yeah, I mean, the people who people. were doing it, the, the, I mean, Roundhouse, who were in the first group, were really good at that. They were just, stuff was going out, and obviously it was, a lot of it was performance-based around bands, so there was already communities online around those bits of interest. So you kind of want to, to find those for the cult, for the more mainstreamy culture stuff, so the people, literally, the, you know, the kind of train spotters and the, yeah. the knitting circles and, uh, you know, you want to get that stuff. So it's getting the niche yeah. kind of sorted. You know, and, and there are people who are doing it and they're doing it really well, mm. but it, is, it won't come back to your website and that that, again, is important for your strategy, that, you, that your success isn't actually your traffic. It might be that you've got to find other, other ways to collect data that demonstrate what you're trying to show. Yeah, can I just echo that, actually? Because one of the things, and it's a question for Jane, actually, with, the, with a couple of um, organisations where we've done some data collecting beyond the analytics, say, survey work, for example, we also find that, broadly speaking, the demographics are very similar online as they are. Um, across a range of different art forms, actually. The one difference seems to be, um, and I know a couple of other studies overseas which found similar results, which is income, which obviously you wouldn't get through analytics data. So what you find is that there are, you know, very intuitively, um, if something is, is streaming free, <laughs> you're more likely to get, you may, you may not break through the class barrier or, you know, other age barrier, or whatever, in terms of audience reach, but you are getting more lower income people. And I'd be interested to know if that's something that you came across, or obviously you wouldn't get that from the analytics, but some of the organisations must have that. Data. The only time we've, I've actually found any evidence for that is with our own Museums at Night project, where we're literally it was something un unbelievable, like 5% of the audience had never been to a museum or gallery ever before. And these, this, was from visit, this is from literally asking people who came to the door. So you can only, you have to do the on-the-ground work if you want. You have to go and ask, oh, go and ask In people. terms of lower-income people, these are people who've been before, though. So I'm not, I'm not you know, so for example, more it's students. This, this is what I meant. So not... You'd need a Hipwise account. Right. Uh, and, uh, we, and we had access to one for a while, and there it's like 25,000. I mean, they're, 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 uh, we're working on a project with the audience um, agency, which were all the audience, the, all the, the, they're the national the audience body, development. that were all the regional audience development agencies. Um, we're scoping out some work that will have a Hitwise account as part of it. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know exactly how that will be, but I'm hoping we might be able to use it to share back into the sector some some of the kinds of observations that 
we did for this report, but more generally to people. So what are trends? I mean, the interesting stuff about Hitwise is you can see where people come from and where they go. So it becomes a, mar it's a marketing plan, basically. Thank you. Uh, there was a gentleman. Hi, Jane. Uh, my name is Abhay, and um, I just wanted to react to some of the things you've said. Fantastic stuff. My heart is racing. It's valid <laughs> stuff, the things you said. Uh, when you it, don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, when it comes to the sort of the marriage of digital and culture, the point that I've been making is that organizational change is far more important than technology because what we need to stop doing is going online to change behavior. Yeah. That's far too ambitious. So my suggestion, and I want to see what you say to it, is forget the marketing and communications focus when it comes to using social. Focus on getting the uh, experts online. Then the biggest anxiety that exists, that you're bastardizing the process, the creative process, that can be overcome. Yeah. Any points? <laughs> yeah. So can you just... I think I got that. Focus on you, the content and not your brand. He's, he's, he, right, so put, the expert, put your Do, expertise on show, yeah, share your expertise. Yeah, be confident yes. and, 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 I know, and the rest will follow. Yes, but <laughs> the expertise, uh, the marketing and communications is not the filter for the expertise. It's the experts themselves who have to be very visible. Otherwise, what's going to happen is there's always going to be a fear of the unexpected. What if we do something that creates an unexpected reaction? Yeah, because yeah. In, internally, the resistance is reputation damage. Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. And that, that you wouldn't yeah, avoid although that. if you make a massive faux pas on a Twitter feed where you've got no followers, it is. You know. But yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, but you know, those are the anxieties that need to be tackled anyway. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think you're saying free your arts and your ass will follow. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you know, in a fashion. You know, uh, uh, I know you didn't say that, but that's what I heard. <laughs> that's better a, than uh, the tadpole yeah, yeah. <laughs> As Arts Council, that's the space that we're trying to invest in. So it's digitally native work, so new work that's designed and made for interaction online. So yeah. it's using digital as a palette of tools, much as we use sculpture or painting. Yeah, I remember last year you were saying digital is clay. Yeah. I kept crying, digital is clay. It's the thing you make something out of. Absolutely. And just that viral word of mouth... Uh, that you mentioned, Peter, it's word of mouse. Good, isn't it? I didn't make that up. <laughs> Another question. Paul? It's so cold in here. <laughs> We're going to get up and stamp in a minute. Well, I right. think we should all get up and dance. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just, just going back to the R&D uh, model. Um, I was interested in, in, I know Hassan, you wrote a, a, a praise of the applications that came in the 400 odd. I wonder if there's any evidence that any of the organizations had pursued those partnerships or developed their own R&D without that available funding. Um, was there anything to be learned or any follow-up that had taken place? It's, to be honest, I don't, for various reasons, the speed with which, the scale, the size of the fund, the speed with which we put it together, um, meant that it's difficult to say what the additional impact of the pilot fund has been. I mean, I can give some anecdotes. So, for example, um, Batty Art Centre project, uh, which is an online scratch um, project, and also the Imperial War Museum's um, social interpretation project. Both are ones which are the brand, as projects are surviving and are being developed quite significantly within those organisations. Um, Certainly within the Imperial War Museum, one of the big challenges, I understand it, is actually taking a project which is situated as a R and D project. That's just something that a team did and bringing that into the mainstream within the organisation. It's a big organisation, multi-site. So there are challenges there. Um, but anecdotally, there's certainly a sense in which the projects of you know um, live on. Um, with the R and D fund proper, um, when we could be funding 90, 100 projects. Um, we've got a very ambitious sort of evaluation strategy in mind. So, and the word evaluation, unfortunately, is quite a loaded term. So it's, it's almost like there's a new word that we're trying to look for. It's not really quite research either. But what we want to do is build a longitudinal data set, not just for organisations that are participating in the fund and describing their digital behaviours, but across the entire, entire arts and cultural sector, which will allow one of the advantages of that we can then say with a high degree of confidence what the additional impact's been, because what we'll be doing is tracking the innovation journeys of the organisations participating in the fund with those that aren't. 
So that's the sort of data which just is taken for granted exists in other areas of economic life, but which that sort of, you know, it, it, it's nothing like that. We don't have any data sets like that at all. So, um, so anecdotally, my feeling is, is yes, I mean, there's definitely been, I mean, one of the advantages of having so many applications, why it's so important for us to have something to choose from, is that we didn't find ourselves supporting projects that were put together purely for the purposes of the fund, which is obviously a real big danger when funding is tight. You have the luxury of going for projects which are obviously a, being, a, if, you know, a, were being built in any case. So it's slightly perversely, an, an ideal project would be something which is already happening. It's just that there's no evaluation structure built around it. So, you know, there's already buy-in for the project in the organisation. And what we're doing through the R&D fund is really building that knowledge system around it to sort of extract data. For me, that's the ideal project because the incentives are already in place. You're not having to connect people or nudge them. They're already doing it. Um, so I don't know if that's sort of a half answer to your question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments on that? Another question. We've got time for one more. Hi, I'm Abby Enoch, CEO of Capture Limited, and we provide technology solutions to the cultural sector. And uh, so as a technologist, I'm quite interested to hear the debate. And um, clearly your strength is, is working out what exactly needs to be done, exactly as, as we said. But then once you've got those ideas, translating them to a technology company can be a little bit like mixing oil and water sometimes. And uh, one word to a, a technologist means an entirely different word to uh, a creative person. And, uh, uh, you know, a comment from a creative with lots of capital letters and exclamation marks in it to a, d a developer in the morning is deeply insulting. So um, the, the bridge between the two is so important, and sometimes this gets ignored. So, I mean, for us in our company, sort of excellent project management and that real ability to translate between the creatives and the technologists and also business management, so the funds are being properly managed um, I think it's crucial to success of any kind of project. Could Just a comment, more. really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was going to say, I, I, would, I, I, I think the missing gap, actually, and it is closing very, very slowly, is organisations need to understand the process. They, yeah. the, they yeah. need to know uh, what the issues are and they need to have the skills in-house. Even if they don't code and they don't actually develop and they don't actually design, they need to be doing the, you know, getting as far as almost the kind of uh, planning the user journeys and planning the the output and planning the um, completely the kind yeah. of you know the architecture and, and getting the whole tone of voice that has to come from the organisation yeah. and I think they often enter into these things and and then they confront all those issues for the first time through the learning curve yeah. which is a perfect place to do it actually in an R and D place but you know what's good what's good about the R and D fund is it's an R and D fund so go and try it out yes. that's great and then learn from it which is why the evaluation is so good so I, I would I really would advocate for organisations to, and for, for the arts counter, to support people to skill up in-house with understanding. I think yeah. you also talk about get your clarity of purpose as an organisation and then be, have the online iteration of that clarity. Yeah. Don't, and I think sometimes, you know, particularly organisations go to build their first website or build their first bit of a certain type of technology. Sometimes the developers yeah. will ask you, go, ask you a question like, well, what are you trying to say in two sentences? Or why are you doing this? And but we all go, oh, well. Have you, have, you you been, have you been to lots of those culture hacks? They all come up with the same solutions all the time. And that's because the solutions are coming from the developers who don't understand the content like the curators exactly. and the organisations do. So yeah. the solutions have to come from the organisations creatively is at first. Do the so solutions have to come or do the problems have to come that the technologists no, can I, find I agree, solutions both, I think. I think you actually well, have to know what you want to say and have the personality. Uh, I mean, I, I, think, I think the problems come to start with and then I think you can work with, tech, with, with, with the process-driven part of a technology company to help you think yeah, about the solutions. The constraints, you know, well, you, actually you can't, that's really yeah. expensive, so uh, let's drop uh, that a bit. And another yeah. very important part of all this, assuming you get through, you know, you, you mountaineer the Andes and you get to the other side safely and... and uh, the project's successful, then uh, qu quite often we find that, that um, people then haven't got any resources to then launch it and champion it. So we yeah. have a whole department devoted to that, yeah. to helping people run a system once they've got it. Yeah. And, th and, th and that's what makes well, it fly. You know, there's content in it, people are using it, people talk yeah. about it, the whole thing ga gathers a momentum of its own. Yes. So it's not all about technology, it's about yeah. those other things around yeah, it no, as well to make it work. And you've touched on another really important point, which is building stuff 
on the organisation's own systems so that they can afford to yeah. run them, not yeah. building yeah. them outside. And so, so it's got to have the done. same uh, content management system for the website as they did have in the gallery. I mean, that if you were going back to, to basics, you'd reinvent the whole thing and just ha get all your data sorted and then repurpose it on every platform, Absolutely. in the gallery, on the web, everything. Echo that a million times. Yeah. And that, the, the, the um, uh, friend of mine, who, Seb, who's worked on these projects, is now at Cooper Hewitt, which is part of the Smithsonian in New York, and they've been shut, and that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. They're, he's going back, um, and he's dealing with all, you know, the institute, the politics of the Smithsonian is like kind of a, like being a small country, yeah. but he's kind of going back and uh, just working on the quality of the data to repurpose in every single platform in outside the gallery so that because the audiences are fluid you know we don't we're not yeah. offline and online we're just people who have behaviors which involve technology sometimes and sometimes they don't yes i mean the whole thing about repurposing data again is is so um ill understood sometimes and i mean it's a bit like going to a kitchen thinking you need a different kitchen to make an omelet and a different <laughs> kitchen to make a souffle That's actually a you need good. the same kitchen yeah. just need to use the eggs a bit differently yeah. and uh, Ooh, that would save people i love millions. cooking an analogy don't you <laughs> i always get them Thank you. Okay. Uh, last question for our session is going to be over with Lara, but I'm, I'm reminded in that conversation, there's a fantastic phrase that goes, when all you have is a hammer, every problem presents itself like a nail. And there's something <laughs> for me about when all, if, if the organisations have a, you know, think that it's got to be an app or nothing, so the app has become the hammer, isn't it? Well, oh, I don't know, we're not reaching young people. Oh, we need an app for that then. Well, you know, that if you've no, you got... You need a Facebook account for young people. You need people. a Facebook, yeah, for the youth. You certainly do. No, well, you don't, well, you don't actually. I know, I know, I'm being You don't, because they'll do it with, they're, they're doing it without you. They don't need you. They do need me. So, <laughs> could, could I ask them a question before? Yeah. I'm just um, having a chat with Jane, sorry. Yeah, no, it, it, it kind Lara, of ties into... I you were um, waving and telling us to I was, stop. No, I was waving, not driving. Because she wanted to ask. <laughs> She's waving for attention. This is the last question, though, we're going to get... And we're probably going to um, make you run over. Um, because um, we seem to have lost people in all of this. Um, and I have to say, one of the reasons that we deprogram this conference is that it isn't about solutions and problems and technology and arts organisations. And it's a kind of space in between. And it seems to have... Um, just suddenly gone down a bit of a cul-de-sac um, about that because uh, how do you, I mean, you, you said Jane how do you know what failure looks like if we don't know what success looks like somebody earlier was just coming up with solutions well what, how, who knows what the problems are so digital as we were talking about yesterday is not the solution to everything and I think we're, we're coming back down to your website's not working you're not engaging with young people you're not engaging with XYZ whatever demographics and that's what your solution is well that's not what we're talking about what we're saying is how do we take more risk in it. Coming back to the beginning of this, it was about risk and innovation and putting the audience back into this because that's kind of seems to have been, you know, fallen down a bit. So how do we not make it about problems and solutions and start making it more about digital is just one of many ways of looking at new audience development, looking at new revenue models and people changing what they do. Right. So kind of re getting a new, fe not fetishising it either way, actually. It's really just easy to ask people. You, you can just go <laughs> and out to your venue and stand at there and just ask people when they come in. Have they been to the website? What are they here for? What's their motivation for coming? Who are they here with? You know, you can do a hut stand there for a day and ask 50 people. Yeah. And, you, you, and it may not be statistically accurate, but it'll be really, really insightful. And it's really simple. A little comment from Julia and then I think... Uh, just a comment, but because Nesta and the Arts Council are on the panel and being quite heavily challenged by your research in a way, saying show the failure, the R&D fund still wants you to stipulate which arts organization you're going to work with, even though you've got a, a research partner, you've got digital companies. What happens when you turn that on its head and start to look at the commissioners being part of that, squaring the triangle and putting them in there, and that's audience as well. So that could be young people, that could be audiences, it doesn't seem to allow for that to happen. So that's something I'd, you know, for, because that's risky to arts organisations. They're not going to lead on something where they put the commissioning in the hands, necessarily a little bit of it, into the hands of commissioners. And so digital, as long as that doesn't happen, will still be about websites, apps, etc., because it's about gatekeeping. Ooh. Could you, sorry, I'm not, sure I fully, yeah. I'm not sure I fully got, are you saying it's like, a, it's like almost like um, there's a supply bias by not including uh, well, you've got, well, you've got to understand where the money came from the money the revenue yes. actually came from arts council sure. and it was specifically that petri dish moment let's put resource yeah. 
give it to Nesta. We want the science and technology, but it is fundamentally the arts organisations that have to make. But on good project management, of course, you would include users and commissioners. Yeah. I think that's going to be all we have time for. And um, thank you so much for your participation in here and also all you out in streaming land. Um, can I actually just give a little... Um, he's not in the room, I don't think. Dave Hart. He's been... Um, if you look at the Twitter stream on the hashtag, he's been adding some really useful extra documents, backgrounds, full stuff around Punch Drunk. So um, cheers, Dave. Thank you very much. Um, okay. 30 seconds and then we will all get up, stamp about and have some tea and coffee. Tea and coffee is back in, oh, is in the back. We're going to open, we're going to have a big reveal. Tea and coffee's at the back. Please help yourself. But then at, uh, it's just a little bit later. At, we'll run the panels from 22. At 22, can you make your way to your panel talks? Um, panel talk one, transforming cultural heritage is in here. Panel talk two is moved, and so panel talk six, yeah? Oh, no, so panel talk two is in Zelig, and by that we mean that isn't the one that's moved, it's the workshop in the afternoon. Panel talk two, sorry, beg your pardon. Yeah, panel talk one is in the theatre. Panel talk two is over in Zelig, and that's where we had lunch yesterday. People who don't know, you just go to the side where you registered, in that little space where they've got them falling men and they'll take you up in the lifts. And panel talk three, I've got the wrong information. He's in, in here. Got you. Ignore what I just said. God, I just, really am not earning my money. Panel talk one. Hands up who's going to panel talk one. I'm claiming this back. You, people with your hands up now, are going to the theatre over by the, um, over in the main, main building. Panel talk two, can transforming cultural business models. No, I thought it was, it's workshop two and six, isn't it? Forget, yeah. No, panel talk two, it's, don't start, is in Zelig, over up in the, uh, up in the um, penthouse. Panel talk three, old library. Starting at 22, please enjoy. Can we just have a very quick hand for our speakers, weren't they brilliant? And thank you.